So the talk that I'm going to do today is actually based on uh, my second book, um, which, um, and what Pedro didn't say is that uh, Pedro's um, probably the primary reason, not probably, he is the primary reason that I got my PhD. Um, because I, I would have been, yes. And, and I think a lot of times when we think about teachers, um, we don't, we don't think about um, university faculty right in that way. And so Pedro is one of the finest teachers that I've ever had in my life. Um, and I would have been expelled from the doctoral program. I'm, I'm not joking. Like, seriously, they were, wanted to expel me. Um, and he advocated for me um, in really profound ways. Um, but he also um, taught me during that advocacy. So he didn't excuse me from from me sort of owning um, my own responsibility in uh, blowing up the doctoral program. Um, but at the same time, um, he saw the, uh, the capacity and the potential that I had as a teacher um, and as a researcher. And so this, um, this talk that I'm going to share with you, which he has never seen, is actually um, based on my second book. And my second book was my dissertation. Um, which, by the way, was a piece of crap. Um, he, he says it wasn't that bad. Um, so, so I cleaned it up and, and, and turned it into a book. Um, and, and it's really about the things um, that I've learned over... I've been a teacher in, in my community in East Oakland for 21 years. And it's really about the things that I've learned um, over those 21 years that have produced um, a really well-documented level of uncommon success um, for us in our classroom. Um, that is really driving the work we're doing around the country to share those lessons um, and those struggles with other educators and school leaders. So um, the, the talk, uh, as I said, is, um, is of the same title as, as the book. Um, and what you can see in the um, lower left-hand corner is, is uh, the cover of the book. Um, and, and my contact information is on there. And anything that's in these slides today, I'm happy to share with you. Um, so if, if there's stuff in the slides that you, you don't catch, citations, whatever that you want, um, just feel free to email me and I'll be happy to um, send you the slide deck. So um, the title of the book is What a Coach Can Teach a Teacher. And the reason that I wrote uh, this um, book was because the best professional development that I have had as a classroom teacher, um, I got because I was a varsity basketball coach. The best development um, that I got as a teacher, I got as a coach. Okay? And then I, then I applied those things to my learning as a teacher. And what I found, um, and, and you know, I, I was raised um, as an athlete. Uh, I was a Division I uh, scholarship recruit in multiple sports. And, um, and the best instruction that I got growing up um, was also right, as an athlete. Um, the best IEPs I got were as an athlete. And so um, I think there's a lot there for us to learn um, as people that are trying to coach and develop teachers um, from sport. Okay? And so what I do in the book is the, the, the last chapter is called the top 10 teacher takeaways. And, and these are 10 things that I have seen. Um, and I've had the privilege, because I did this research, um, of, of spending time with some of the most successful sports coaches in this country. And, and they're, they're truly master pedagogues. And what I found was um, 10 things that I wanted to share back with teachers and school leaders that I see um, highly effective coaches do, that I also see highly effective teachers do. Okay? Um, the first of those, um, principles that I see in great coaches and in great teachers is they have a clearly developed philosophy okay, about what they believe about the work that they're doing. Okay? And th the truth is that, um, that there isn't some beautiful philosophy, teaching philosophy, that we can just hand out that will make everybody a great teacher. In the same way that that's true in sports. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, if you're not a, a fan of sports, just go along with me. Um, if, if you are, this will really resonate with you. So take basketball, for example. Okay. Any basketball fans in here? Okay. Any Nick fans in here? Sorry. 
It's okay, I'm a Raider fan, so you can say that back to me. But... Oh, but you guys have the Jets and the Giants, so. Okay, okay, okay. We won some Super Bowls in the 70s. So, basketball fans, um, what's, what's the best defense? Is it man? Is it zone? Is it full court press? Zone press? Mix it up, right? It depends. Exactly right. Okay. That all of those defenses that I've just named off have won national championships. All of those defenses have won NBA championships. All of those defenses have won gold medals. Okay. And the reason for that is, is because it's not the defense. Okay. It's not the defensive schema that actually wins. Right. It's the belief that the coach has in that schema, and that coach's ability to get all of their players working inside of that schema as a team, okay? And then what happens is everybody tries to copy the schema. It's like, oh, Jim Beheim, okay, won another championship with that 2-3 zone. Let's run a 2-3 zone. But they don't believe in the 2-3 zone in the way that Beheim believes in the 2-3 zone, and so they never beat Beheim. Emerson wrote once that imitation is always suicide, okay? So if I'm going up against Beheim, I ain't running a 2-3 zone. Because he's done that for decades, okay? And I think this is what we try to do with teachers, right? We try to create teachers like they're automatons, this carbon copy, okay, that everybody should be on the same pacing guide at the same time, operating in the same way, okay? And, and that is a huge problem in the profession because it deprofessionalizes teachers, okay? One of my teachers and, and favorite people on the planet eh, who recently passed is, is Howard Zinn. Okay? And Zinn said once about his teaching, he said, I was going to be one of those teachers, I was not going to be one of those teachers at the end of the year. The students wanted to know, where does this teacher stand? They were going to know where I stood from the very beginning. That's been my attitude all the way through, and it still is. And this is why he was such a fine teacher. Okay? Because he did not hide he didn't act as though teaching is a, is, is a politically neutral activity. He said teaching is a highly politicized activity. This is what I believe. You don't have to agree with me, but you need to know who I am and what I believe in. Okay? And the best teachers in the country that I've seen, frankly, do that for off top. Okay? Their kids really know who they are. Okay? But we don't do that work with teachers. We don't do it in pre-service. We don't do it in in-service. And there is no expe expectation that teachers actually start the year sharing who they really are with the kids okay? or that they actually inquire who the kids are, right, that they're going to be making um, this investment in of time and love and care and energy and, and academics too. So. Um, there's a series of questions that we do with teachers that I think is a really good starting point for helping teachers develop their philosophy. Right? But I want to reference David Tyak here, who did a, a, a really powerful book um, in the 70s on the history of public schooling in this country. Right? And one of the things that he said was is that, that, that one of the mistakes that, that the schooling system has made in this country is they've aimed to create this one best system. And there is no one best system. Just like there's no, the great coaches know that. Okay? The great teachers know that. Okay? You've got to, I'm not saying you don't have a system. Okay? But just understand okay, that there isn't a one best system. Okay? That there has to be space for teachers to have mobility inside of the system that we build. Otherwise, and, and the same with players. Okay? If you have a coach who just mandates that you run things in this way, eventually you run into a team who breaks down your offense. And then you've got to be able to think and read and react on your own. Okay? And we don't do that for teachers. We act as though we can give them this playbook that everything that comes up, they just you know, reference the tree chart and then it's like, oh, I do this. Okay? And, and master teachers okay, that I've worked with all over the country okay, all have a lesson plan. They also know that that lesson plan is not going to work. And so what they learn how to do is find the lesson inside the lesson. Okay? But you cannot do that if you insist that the teachers hold to this pacing guide okay? and that everybody be at the same place at the same time. Okay? So the work has to begin, though, with the teacher themselves. 
Okay? We don't do enough development work with the human being that is the teacher. Okay? So some, some really powerful questions that we do with teachers as the starting point. Before we talk about data, test scores, curriculum, any of that, let's start with you. Okay? And so we take them through this series of questions that begins with, first, they're allowing them to dream again. Who have you always wanted to be as a teacher? Here's why this is so important. Okay? It's kind of shady on my part to do this, okay? and this is why. Because what happens is, 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 how do you think teachers describe themselves? I'm talking about recalcitrant 30-year vets, okay? recalcitrant rookie teachers, master 30-year vets, awesome, highly uh, uh, potential, skilled first-year teachers. What do you think they say? How, what, how high is the bar that they set? Stratosphere, right? I want to connect with all kids. Right? They narrate this vision of themselves. I, I've never met a teacher who narrates this question by saying, well, I signed up to screw kids over. And my goal is to flunk half my class. And I'd like to send at least three kids to the office per period. I've never met that teacher. And yet, though, there's teachers that do that every day. And part of the reason that they can't unlock themselves from that is because we never allow them to re-dream. Okay? We set the bar. Okay? And I can tell you as a classroom teacher that when I set the bar on kids without some real dialogue with them about who do you want to be, what do you believe in, what do you value, then it's my bar. Nobody works as hard for your bar okay, as you do. So allow teachers to set the bar. And what we find is they set it really, really high. And then it's so much easier to hold them to that. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to do any of this. You said you want to do that. My job is to help you do that. Okay? Then we ask them, okay, cool. So that's who you want to be? Who does the community need you to be? And where's their alignment and where's their misalignment? And then we ask them, okay, baseline yourself. Who are you right now? Okay, are because you're not that that visionary teacher that you describe, right? You, but you are someplace, and wherever you are, that's cool. Let's baseline that, and then let's talk about how you're going to work towards becoming okay, that teacher that you've envisioned yourself to become. Okay, and that's where we do the gap analysis with them. Okay, and then the last piece is is that we, then we start looking at different types of data. Okay. What is the data coming from students? What is the data coming from families? What is the data coming from colleagues? And how do we align that with your vision of the master teacher that you want to become? Well, I really learned this from this guy. Okay, this is John Wooden. And, and if you're familiar with basketball at all, you'll know who this guy is. Um, if you're not, you still probably might know who this guy is because he's one of the finest teachers that, that I've ever seen. And I got to spend the day alone with Wooden, just me and him in his apartment. And it was one of the most powerful experiences that I've had in my life as a student, as a teacher, as a coach, as a man, as a father, um, as a community member. And one of the things that he said to me is, um, he said, you can be good at a lot of things, but you can only be great at a few. And you're going to need to choose whether you want to be good or you want to be great. Okay? And I think... That, that most of the dialogue that we're feeding to teachers right now is at best going to allow them to be good. Because we're asking teachers to do a million different things, and you can't be great at a million different things. So we've got to give teachers much more professional autonomy okay, about what are the things in the Common Core, what are the things in states, national, whatever, okay, that, that I want to really focus at being great on. Okay? And just understand that that's going to mean they're not great at everything. Okay, but I'd rather have teachers who are great at a few things okay, and then, and then fill, figure out how, how to build a team because I've got Pedro who's great at A, B, and C. I've got Wade who's gr great at D, E, and F. I, now I know who to recruit as a principal. Now I know who to recruit as a superintendent. That's what coaches do. I've got a great shooting guard. I'm not looking for a shooting guard in the draft. I'm looking for a center because we don't have a center. Right? But if you think of all teachers doing the same thing every day in the same way, then you don't know how to recruit, okay? which is a major problem in our field. Now, what's really interesting is, is that Wooden had one of the most sophisticated coaching philosophies that, that we've seen in, in the modern era. Okay? And this is why he won 10 national championships. 
Okay, so some of you have probably seen this before. This was his coaching philosophy called the Pyramid of Success. Does anybody know where he, where he developed this? Okay, nope. Not at Purdue. He coached at Purdue, though. Nope, not at UCLA, which is where he won all his championships. What's that? Okay, close. Pedro said as a guidance counselor. John Wooden taught high school English in Indiana for 10 years. And he, he made the pyramid of success for his high school English class because he realized that his students did not understand what success was. They thought success was their GPA. They thought they were successful if they got an A. Okay? And I had to learn this as an athlete. There were times when our team blew the other team out, one by 40 in who. Okay? And our coach was yelling at us. And I'm like, dude, what's your problem? We just won by 40. And, he's, and, and what the best coaches I've ever had said, it's not about the scoreboard. There's times when you lose by 10, and it's the best game you've played all season. Okay? And we don't, we're, we're so consumed with outcomes okay, that we've lost track of process. Okay? And then we share that with kids. So kids don't even understand what excellence is. Because we model okay, that for them. Right? We don't model excellence for them. We don't model an understanding that every teacher is going to be at a different level. Okay? And that excellence okay, is not about some agreed upon set of outcomes. It's not about the scoreboard. It's about the process. Okay? Are you getting better every single day? Okay? And we're so focused on the end point okay, that we've stopped learning how to value growth over time in teachers. And as a result, Hey, teachers have stopped learning how to value growth over time in kids. So much of what Wade was saying right, was about that. Um, and, and just to be clear, um, we're, we're not going to cover all ten. Okay? So, buy the book. <laughs> this is the tease. Okay? I also learned marketing as an athlete. So... Um, the third of the ten principles um, is, is about pedagogy. Okay? So if you've got a philosophy, okay, that philosophy should be driving your pedagogy. Now I want to be clear about what I mean by the word pedagogy. Okay? Pedagogy is what you teach, how you teach it, and why you teach it. And we never ask teachers that. And frankly, because teachers don't get to pick. They don't get enough choice, professional option over what they teach how they teach, and why they teach it. And for that reason, it's really difficult to teach with passion okay? if it's not your pedagogy. So we have to allow teachers a greater sense of ownership over what they teach, how they teach it, and why they teach it. Okay? And the why is really filtered through their philosophy. Okay? Why, who are you? Who do you want to be? Right? Why do you teach? And then let that drive your curriculum. Cornel West um, has one of my favorite quotes about pedagogy. And, and uh, he said that young people okay, don't want to hear a sermon. They want to see one. Okay? And I see a lot of teachers lose track of this. I see a lot of coaches lose track of this, but not the successful ones. Successful teachers and coaches both understand okay, that their best pedagogy is the way they live their life. Okay? And we know this right through, through these different dichos or, or sayings that we have in our different cultures, right, about that, that, that kids are always learning from what we do, right, as adults. And I don't think we keep track of that enough, okay? That, that I'm called to schools all over the country, and they ask me to help them with their youth culture, okay? These kids are off the hook, they're out of control, can you, you know, maybe if we had ethnic studies, it'd be better. And so I'm like, okay. So I come in there, and, the, and, and, the, and they're like, okay, you know, who do you want? I said, well, the first thing I want to do is just kind of just kick it for a minute. Okay? And what I look at is the adult culture. Okay? And what I see in schools that are really struggling is toxic adult cultures. And then what I see is I see the kids doing exactly what I watch adults do. Okay? And then when I start pointing that out to people, they're like, oh, yeah. Okay? And I say, you don't have a youth culture problem. You have an adult culture problem, okay? And the kids will respond to whatever they see the adults doing because what the adults are doing is their pedagogy. The way in which they're interacting with each other, hating on each other, right? Despising each other, not loving each other. Okay? That, in the same way that destroys a basketball team, it destroys a school. If you have infighting in the locker room, you're screwed. 
I don't care how much talent you have, Miami. <laughs> right? And they lost track of that during this season. If you look at the early part of Miami's season this year, Dimcats was having fun, they were loving each other, and then it got funky. And they couldn't undo the funk, and now what's happening? LeBron's deucing out. Right? Because he knows it's not about talent. It's not about Miami's commitment to win. There's something culturally that has shifted there. Okay? And that's what I see in schools and classrooms that are struggling. Okay? So, first I want to say that our first book, the book that I wrote with, with somebody who now you guys have taken uh, from us, um, Ernest Morell, who's the director of the uh, Center for Urban and Minority Education at Columbia. Ernest and I co-authored our first book. Ernest was also one of Pedro's students. And we taught together for many years, and we coached together for many years. Um, and um, one of the things that, that our, the title of our first book is The Art of Critical Pedagogy, because I believe that pedagogy, I believe teaching is an art form. Okay? And you need to treat teachers like artists. And if you, look, if you study the great artists okay, in the history of the world, um, they're never formulaic, right? but they have a deep investment in the principles of their art form. Okay? So they understand right, the basic principles. Okay? And you see the same thing with athletes. Right? So what I had to learn in order to, to, to really learn how to go between my legs, come back behind my back, and then spin, to do a three-level move, okay? was how to dribble cleanly with both hands. Okay? And so there's a way in which we, you have to have the basic skills, the fundamentals. Okay? And then, right, th but then we never advance teachers past that. We just stay at the, at the rudimentary level. Okay? Once you have the basic fundamentals, that's when you can start breaking rules. Okay? And that's what great artists do. They learn the, the fundamentals of their art form, and then they transform the art form by exploding the fundamentals. Okay? And so there is an importance there in investing and in developing very basic fundamental pedagogical skill in teachers, but then you have to release them to make that their own in a way that is truly reflective of the philosophy they've narrated. Now, in our book, we talk about five fundamental uh, elements of asset-based pedagogy. And this is what you heard uh, way talking about earlier. Okay? Asset-based pedagogy is basically sees every kid in front of you as full of assets. Okay? And, and the, then, then the work is really about how do I draw those assets out okay? to allow them to start addressing the areas where they may not be as strong. Okay? But, but I'm not going to start with the areas you're, you're struggling with. I'm going to start with, with asset mapping. And there's, there's five uh, 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 tenets to this that, that Ernest and I have articulated. Um, I don't have time to go into all of them today. Um, a lot of them hopefully are familiar to you. The one that I want to emphasize is one that, um, that isn't often talked about, which is developing a counterculture in the school or a counterculture in the classroom. And, and so I think that there's so much talk about imp improving schools. Okay? And it's not, it's not intentional enough. Okay? And so the work that we do with schools and the work that I've done for a long time in some of the least successful schools, okay, as a, as a classroom teacher where we had a lot of success, was to be really deliberate about saying, in this classroom, the culture is going to be counter to a culture of mediocrity, to a culture of failure. Okay? So I'm attacking the existing culture. I'm not ignoring it. I'm not pretending it's not there. I know it's there. Okay? And we're going to be very deliberate about naming it okay? and, 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 so, and, and re, uh, reimagining it. Okay, so we're not just going to talk about a culture of excellence. Okay, we're going to talk about a culture of mediocrity. Okay, we're going to name that. Okay, and then we're going to develop a, a culture of excellence that is crushing that sense of mediocrity. Now, nowhere have I seen this as prof Nowhere in this country have I seen it done as well as I've seen it done in the Maori community in New Zealand. Okay, so for 10 years I've been going to New Zealand to work with the indigenous people there, the Maori there, and, and particularly in one school. Okay? And, and at that school, I saw, I saw a set of things over my visits that have shaken me to my core as a human being, right? and certainly as a pedagogue. 
No place that I visited has more directly and consistently impacted my day-to-day -day practice than this school. Okay? And I'm saying this because I encourage you to go visit. First of all, right, the Modi were one generation away from losing their language, which is the death of a culture. And this principle, and that Maori community just outside of Auckland, um, along with uh, uh, a number of Maori activists around the country, said that there's no way that's happening, and that the key to it is the babies. Because the, the, these kids that you're watching, they came to this school, they couldn't speak Maori. Because their parents did not speak Maori. And so the starting point of the school okay, is first Maori, okay, then New Zealander, then citizen of the first Maori. You must know yourself. You must know your ancestors. You must know your culture. You must know your language. First, if you're ever going to perform well on any of these tests, they don't measure any of that. Okay? You've got to first know the kids that are struggling the most in school don't know who they are. They don't know who they come from. So you can sit there up, up there all you want, give them gold stars and tell them, oh, you know, you're amazing and you're, or, 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 or whatever. Like, I really like how you battled through that math problem. Okay? But at the end of the day, when I'm out on the block and I see somebody that looks like me and I hate them because I hate myself, okay? frankly, who cares what my math score is? Okay? College ain't going to save us. Okay? We've got to really start making public schools an investment in the human being. Okay. And so I've traveled the globe looking for that. How do we do that in an academically rigorous college bound way? Okay. Okay. And frankly, I find it to be a false binary. Okay. This idea that we're academically rigorous is, is a false rigor. Okay. If it's not connected to kids learning to love themselves and their own humanity and their people and their ancestors. Okay. And it's, it's totally doable, and it is connected to all these achievement outcomes we say we want. Now, what you saw okay, in the first part was, was the school philosophy around that, right? All of them, right, in, in unison, okay? The master pedagogue understands, okay, that what I am giving you okay, is not a test score. What I am giving you is not a skill set. What I am giving you is a gift. Okay? And because I am giving you this gift. You control who you share this gift with. Okay? This is why I find our education paradigm in this country, and many folks internationally find the education paradigm in this country deeply troubling and continuing to head down a deeply troubling path, okay? is because we don't give gifts. Okay? We don't give gifts anymore. Right? Because it, it's, it can't be a gift if I give it to you and then I say, in six months, I'm going to require you, Calvin and Hobbes, to regurgitate that. Okay? In this way, in this form, okay? now it's not, it's not your gift. Whose gift is it? It's mine. And I'm going to reclaim it from you. And then I'm going to score you on it. Okay? And I think there's a place for that. Okay? But we're over-invested in that. And under-invested in this. Okay? Because these kids got the gift of their ancestors, the gift of their language, the gift of their culture, okay? then they choose who, where, and when they share it with, and that's the second piece you saw. Okay? Some of you got a little seasick there. Okay? Because what you saw in the second piece was unscripted. And I had spent days and days and days with those boys. I'd been to their homes. I'd met their families. I'd broke bread with them. I mean, we built. Okay? Four years later, I flew three of my high school kids out okay, to spend two weeks with them and my family and their families. Okay? And those boys okay, gave me and my wife that gift of saying they wrote that haka for us. Do you understand? Okay? I don't speak Maori, but I speak that. Okay? And that is, the, and I could, you can't ask for that gift. The Maori decide who they will give that to. And they decide when you will get it. Okay? And, and we don't give that. To me, that's what master pedagogy does. Okay? It gives kids a set of gifts okay, that they share when it's time for it to be shared. And they hold it dear to them. So they don't just share it 
okay, based on some time, they share it when they feel like somebody that they really care about deserves to have this gift. Okay? That's the kind of pedagogy that changes test scores. Okay? Not test score pedagogy. Fourth, okay, to do this, okay, I think we got to think harder about the kind of structures that, that we build. Okay? And we got to build structures that develop discipline. Okay? Now, I want to be clear about what I mean. Because I'm probably not talking about the same thing that a lot of people uh, in New York City think about when, when they use the word discipline. Okay? So let me just be clear. Okay? F you know, Michel Foucault said it. Okay? Uh, discipline and punishment are not the same thing. Okay? Discipline, if you actually study the word, but schools act like they are. Okay? When we start talking about discipline, what are we talking about? We're talking about punishment. Okay? When we track discipline, okay? well, Again, right, this is the problem that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a literature teacher, right, and I'm, a, and I'm a writer, and so I'm really interested in, in words. And so I looked up the etymology of the word discipline. Does anybody know the etymology of the word discipline? Okay. Okay. Kind of to teach, okay. It, it, it tracks back to the Latin, okay, and the word discipulus, okay, and discipulus Okay, means okay, rigorous training through repetition. So, I ask you this. How can suspension be discipline? You've just... Punishment. Okay? If you read Michel Foucault, he draws this really interesting distinction. Discipline is a process of inclusion. Okay? In order to be trained, you must be present. Punishment is a process of exclusion. Okay? And we've conflated those as though they're the same when they are told, I am all about discipline. If you come and look at my high school classroom in East Oakland, okay, you will see our commitment to discipline. I have a highly disciplined classroom. Okay? But in 21 years in that city, okay, and Pedro can attest to the schools that I've worked in, it's those schools. Okay? In 21 years, I have never once sent a kid to the office. Not once. Never written a referral. You want to know why? Because they don't work. You know how I know? I got sent to the office all the time. Can you picture that? Okay. And all that did when I took that referral was I looked at you and I knew you weren't the business. I knew that you didn't really want to deal with me and what I was bringing. Because when I was a nut in school is because I was going through some stuff on the block, in the house, that didn't nobody want to talk about. They just wanted me to come in the school building and be cool and be compliant and sit and be nice and raise my hand and turn on all my homework. And I'm thinking to myself, man, can you please just see me? Oh, you can't see me? Can you see me now that I threw this chair? Can you see me now? Okay. And then, no, I can't see you. Go to the office. Okay. Let them see you. Okay. This okay, morally suspect paradigm with the most vulnerable children in our nation is what is bankrupting schools. Okay? It's why kids won't invest. Because you're not really willing to do... But this isn't true everywhere. When you look at wealthy white communities, okay, when a kid nuts up, okay, they don't get suspended. They get counseling. They get support. Because this kid's a genius. So if this kid's not performing like a genius, it must be something we're doing. But when a kid looks like me, comes from where I come from, okay, then it's the kid that's the problem. That's an adult issue. That's a structural issue. Okay? That has nothing to do with kids. So the goal is to develop classrooms and school spaces that invest in rigorous mental training towards a common goal. Okay? And the way we think about it is, and, and I'm quoting now from another one of Pedro's students, you see a theme here. Um, Wayne Yang, who's at UC San Diego in Ethnic Studies, he talks about developing a highly structured apprenticeship rather than a rule-bound reformatory. Okay? And all great teachers know this, right? The more rules you have, the more what you have. The more, th right, the more rule breakers, right? The more enforcement, it's, and you, that's what you get really good at, right? So the, the, when, you, when I go into classrooms and I see class rules, I already know we got, it, we got problems. 
The goal is not to develop a safe space for kids. I, I despise this term. Right? I don't want my classroom to be safe. I want me, my classroom to be full of risk taking. Okay? But we've coached teachers into trying to develop safe spaces where everything's predictable. The thing I love about teaching is it's unpredictable. It's also what I love about sports. I mean, we drew up great offenses. Okay? And frankly, by the third quarter, it didn't work anymore. Because they'd watched film on us. They knew what we were going to do. Okay? And then the game was really on. Okay? Can you read and react right, in those moments? Can you be a risk taker? And then lastly, okay, stop trying to make classrooms equal. We don't need equality. Okay? We need equity. Okay? So don't treat, John Wooden said to me, I treat everybody differently under the same set of rules. And I was like, ooh, that's, that's a good one, John. Thanks, bud. <laughs> so this is um, what we called our definite dozen. And this is what I used as a basketball coach. And I got this from Pat Summit. Okay? And a lot of folks don't know who Pat Summit is, even though they know who John Wooden is. And that's, right, that's where we get to the gender issue. Right? But Pat Summit has actually won more games as a college basketball coach than anybody. And in fact, they tried to recruit her to coach men, and she said, why? <laughs> I already coached the best players in the world. Okay. So um, Summit had something that we, I learned from her, and she talks about it in this book called, called The Definite Dozen. Okay. And it was 12 principles that she taught her players right, that were the core of their philosophy that allowed them to win all these championships. And so I started using that as a basketball coach. And then I was like, why don't I have a definite dozen for my classroom? And so we developed we a definite do. in my high school English classroom. Okay? It is engaging our young people uh, in a call and response. Okay? So um, this is the end of class. Kids are about to go on to their next class period. And this is what we do at the end of every class is what you're going to see in the beginning. Okay? This is them as seniors. Okay? So I've had them now for four years. So how do you think it looks? Polished, right? Okay. So then you're going to see that. So I, we, it's it's twelve things. The that, the dozen. Okay. So you're going to see the first four senior year together with a visitor. Okay. Looks cool. Second one you're going to see is a kid standing by himself saying them in Spanish. So all our kids we have about in this particular court we had about fifty percent Latino kids um, and about probably about eighty percent of them were Spanish speakers. Twenty um, percent were not. Let's not assume that all Rasa folks speak Spanish. Um, and then um, and about half the class was, was um, black African descent. And they, all the kids had to learn it in both English and Spanish. So who do you think was teaching the monolingual English black and Latino kids how to say it in Spanish? That's asset pedagogy. Okay? Now, not, not to me, right? It's a real asset when their peers value it. Okay? And so that the, the monolingual English speakers needed the Spanish speakers to be able to do this, and then they had to stand in front of the class and say it in Spanish by themselves. And then the class votes on whether or not it's clean. Okay? And if you make any, and it's a trip, right? Kids are way tougher on each other than we are. Right? They push the bar up. I'm like, well, I would have passed you, but you better talk to him. He didn't pass you. So that's what you're going to see in the second one, is a kid solo. And the third one you're going to see is what it looks like in year one with freshmen. How do you think that looks? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have a little fun with the freshman one at the end. So this is the definite dozen, or in Spanish, la docena definitiva. Are you ready? Yes. yes. This is the definite dozen. This is when you're so sorry, no one else has to. Today's your revolutionary state of mind. One, be responsible to yourself, to your family, to your community, to our world. Two, be respected, be respectful. Respect yourself, demand that others respect you, respect others. Three, be honest with you, don't make excuses and make improvements. Four, be loyal, stand alongside those who have beliefs. Para disciplinar tu estado de mente revolucionario. Cinco, trabaja todos los días en todo lugar. Seis, estudia. Estudiar es un deber revolucionario. 7. Carácter sobre reputación. Carácter es quien eres cuando nadie te ve. 
Okay. At the end of the definite dozen, because he's in ninth grade, and ninth graders are super squirrely. Okay. And by the time they get to number twelve, they're already focused on the homie that they've been messing around with all class period. Okay. So I seen that, okay. and I snatched Muhammad up, and I hemmed him up in the corner, and I said, "Don't do that. Don't you ever do that. Not during the definite dozen. That is sacrosanct and sacred in this space." You don't ever, ever disrespect those 13 principles. There's 12 that are numbered. Okay? There's one that is unnumbered okay? because the purest. And the purest one is one I got from a coach, which is discipline yourself so that no one else has to. Okay? And you can't even begin to start the definite dozen until you have that. Okay? And so, what do you think Muhammad said? Yeah, right on, dude. <laughs> Got you, my bad. Okay, that's Muhammad in ninth grade, right? Muhammad just finished his freshman year on a full ride to Berkeley. <laughs> now, I could have had a different reaction to that, right? I mean, he he went there, right? That's that's certainly a, a, an offense that I could send him to the office for. I could write. I mean, there's all kinds of things, right? But that was the lesson inside the lesson for the day that Muhammad needs, right? That's the, if you, we don't give teachers more identity work, more uh, mobility, more control over the day, then all they have is these weak-minded tools, okay, like the referral system that we offer them, okay, instead of pedagogy and teaching, right? So it's critical right, that we focus with teachers on how do you develop structures that allow you to find lessons inside the lesson. Right, so let's say you got that piece together. Right? Then you move into the second half right, of the 10. And I combine these two. Um, there's, there's points when they're separate and there's points when they're together. I'm combining them um, because I'm going to give you another example from my class about when, uh, when I did this in a way that, that had a big impact. Um, so if you've got your system okay, and nobody buys in, it doesn't matter. Right? So you've got to spend time getting buy-in to your system, getting kids to believe in the def in the definite dozen and their value. And, and the way that you do that is, is that you find moments like I just narrated with you with, um, with Muhammad that become really powerful, teachable moments. And so I'm going to give you another example about when that happens. So this same group, this same school year, a little bit later in the year, we're doing, um, we're doing these debates. And it was a debate, they were debating um, culpability in um, Animal Farm and The Matrix, okay? And, and so we did this, all this comparing, and we have this court case, right, where we put um, uh, members from The Matrix and members from Animal Farm on trial for being culpable for creating this really toxic society. And, um, and so during the, 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 the trial, this is sort of coming down to the key um, day, and, um, and and so there's, there's, we set it up like a, um, like, kind of like a competition where there was like a bracket and there was actually four teams and it's, it's I, I won't get into the complicatedness of the, the, the curriculum, but, um, but on, at the beginning of the trial, two teams come and they are the business and they just murder the other two teams as though the, and, and it was clear that the other two teams just didn't prepare. Right? They were just in there just winging it, right? They thought they had good mouthpiece, and they just, you know, I just make it up as I go, right? And then you're like, you're making this up as you go, huh? <laughs> and so, um, so I'm really, really pissed at them, okay? Because to me, right, it's about effort, right? If you give me effort, right, I can, I can teach from there, right? But if I'm not getting any effort, that's where we're going to start. So I, I give them the business about, and I'm like, look, tomorrow, okay, the two teams that got whooped, you two are going at each other. And the two teams that, that brought the business, you're going to go at each other. So you two that were not the business today, you better be right tomorrow. Whatever you got to do, you better be right. I'll, I'll stay here after school as long as I need to stay okay, if you all want to come and get right. Okay, if you got it, cool. So the next day they show up. How do you think it went? Terrible. They were worse day two than they were day one. 
Okay? And the two teams that were really strong were even stronger. Okay? Now I'm hot. Now, now I'm mad. Okay? And so we have, we have and, this whole, and I'm just like, and, and, and look, if you really build strong relationships with your kids, it's the same as with my sons, right? The greatest card I have to play on my sons and on my students is disappointment. That's the last thing they want to do is disappoint someone that they know loves and cares about them. Okay? So I go, I just leave it at that. Right? I just look at them and I say, you know what, frankly, I, I'm just shook. Because I've never been this disappointed before. And it, it was hushed like that. Right? In a ninth grade class in East Oakland. Okay? That, that alone is like, you know, deserves merit. Okay? <laughs> so I go home that night and I'm thinking, how, where's the lesson there? That's, right? What, what do I got to do to, to really teach? Because it, it, they're not going to recover now, right? That, that, they're there, that's where they're stuck, right? And so what's the bigger lesson so that in our next unit, they can, they're permitted to step up and be who they really want to be? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and, 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 and then I remember this clip from this film. And so I go and I, and I, you know, get it off YouTube, and I, I pirate it. <laughs> and you all know about BitTorrent? Yes. Okay, yeah, so, yes, sir. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I pirate it because um, guess what's blocked in my school? BitTorrent and YouTube, right? Which is absurd, right? Like, this is, has, how's this, is this cured the gang problem? It's a huge resource for teachers. It's like, no, you can't because, you know, kids might look at salacious material. Fool, they, they're looking at it already. You can't stop them. They're just using their phone. It's, it's, I digress. So, so I come up with this clip, okay? And we come back in the next day, and they sit down. And, and what had happened was is that the top two teams, that the prize for the competition was whoever... whoever uh, one got to come over to the house and I was going to cook them dinner. The, the whole team got to come and, and, and I don't understand why they think that's a prize. It's because they've never had my cooking before. <laughs> you know, but they just want to like spend time with you, right? So they're going to come over and I'm going to um, microwave them something. And, <laughs> and so on, on the, the final day when the two teams came back and they were both really bad and the other two teams they were both really good, I couldn't figure out who one, because they were both so good, right? And I was just so pissed at the other two teams being so bad. So uh, I said, you know what? I need a night to deliberate on this, and then I'll tell you guys who won tomorrow when I come in. And they're like, okay, cool. So first of all, that's a really good trick to get everybody on time to first period. Okay? And don't be above bribery. Okay? So, so everybody's in the class. I don't know what to say, really. Three minutes to the biggest battle of our professional lives all comes down to today. Either we heal as a team or we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen. Believe me. And we can stay here, get the shit kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell. One inch at a time. Now, I can't do it for you. I'm too old. I look around, I see these young faces and I think I mean I made every wrong choice a middle-aged man can make I uh, I pissed away all my money believe it or not I chased off anyone who's ever loved me and lately I can't even stand the face I see in America You know, when you get old in life, things 
get taken from. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that itch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that itch. We claw with our fingernails for that itch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning and losing. fight it's the guy who's willing to die who's gonna win that itch and i know if i'm gonna have any life anymore it's because i'm still willing to fight and die for that itch because that's what living is the six inches in front of your face now i can't make you do it you gotta look at the guy next to you look into his eyes now i think you're gonna see a guy who will go that inch with you you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's the team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individuals as football guys that's all it is now what are you gonna do <laughs> a speech like that in my class with like cool music like that and, you know, so, so I understand right that, but but what's a trip to me is okay as an athlete I can tell you that that I had coaches that cared that much okay about us as a team and what we were doing I rarely see teachers entitled to care that much okay? and and frankly if you come in my class you'll see that that when I teach Okay? And when, when I see the best teachers in the country, they teach not like me, right? It doesn't have to be like that testosterone filled, with, right? But, but there's a way in which you get this sense that this person believes that what they're doing is life and death. Okay? And so when a child is not getting it, it's never about a test score. It's never about an outcome. It's about them not understanding the significance of what we're doing here to saving our own lives. To fund, and, and, and in my community, that's real talk. I'm, I live on the 3400 block of East Oakland, which is one of the most violent communities in the United States. So this is, I know, it is literally life and death. I have buried children whose schools have failed, in part because schools failed them. They were on the streets when they should have been in the classroom, and they got dumped on. And I don't think we take this gig that seriously all the time. And we certainly don't entitle teachers okay, to take the gig that seriously. But what's the trip is we let coaches do it. And kids get a message that hoop and football are more important in this school and in this community than, than how I'm learning literacy and numeracy. Okay? And that mixed message is interrupting the lives of a lot of kids. And it doesn't have to be that way. So after I play this, what I say to them is this. I say, so yesterday, it was about inches. The, the two teams that had that shot at dinner, okay, you were phenomenal. And so what separated you was inches. 
And that inches is because one of you came in five minutes late. And because you came five minutes late, your team lost an inch. Now, if there was something deep okay, that, that led to that, then let's have that conversation. But if you were five minutes late because you were playing grab ass in the hallway, because you were lollygagging, because you didn't sprint to get here on time to save that inch, then that inch cost you the championship. And that's the lesson that you need right now. And the kid knew who it was, and he is known for the grab ass. Okay? <laughs> so he was late because he wasn't on his business. Okay? And so it cost his team the championship. And he likes to eat, so he was especially disappointed. Okay? Now, every once in a while as a teacher, you get hard evidence that the lesson inside the lesson stuck. And they're magical moments. And this was one of those moments. Three days later, huge numbers of kids all over the city walk out to protest budget cuts. And that kid was one of them. And they, our kids walked down to the Fruitvale BART station, which becomes famous because of Fruitvale Station and Oscar Grant. So that's the community that I'm from. And um, so they all gather at the BART station for this rally for educational justice and funding. And one of my students from Rasa Studies at San Francisco State is at the rally. And she videotapes the rally and sends me a clip from the rally and says, I see you're still changing lives. And this is the videotape she sent me of the kid who cost his team the inches. That's never going to show up on a test score. But it will show up on a test score. And that's the part that we got to trust. Okay? That when they're engaged in that way, when the lessons we teach actually matter in their lives right now, I can use this today. I know what to say at the rally. Give me the mic. Okay? That, that's where we get engagement from. Okay? It's not from a textbook. It's not from an iPad. Right? It's from connecting kids. It's from connecting lessons to their lives. So I'm going to end um, by saying, you know, you, you do all this, right? But the tenth principle that the greatest coaches do and the greatest teachers do to win championships, okay, is that you've got a battle. Okay? It's never clean. If you read the books of coaches that have won national or international championships, they all tell this story about that season where there was this moment where it was all coming apart. Somebody blew their knee out, right? A key player got hurt. They had terrible series of losses, whatever. And it was the master pedagogue in that moment that turned the class. And I think sometimes teachers start believing when the class starts going downhill, it's a wrap. No, that's the greatest teachable moment. Okay? And it's going to ha happen all the time to the best teachers and the best coaches. We all have those downturns in the season where the energy's low, right? Some, some series of tragedies has happened that's really just, and that's where, right, you gotta battle. My favorite quote about battling actually comes from Masada Shakur's autobiography. And she says, if you are deaf, dumb, and blind to what's happening in the world, you're under no obligation to do anything. But if you know what's happening, and you don't do anything but sit on your ass, then you're nothing but a punk. And one of the first things, I'm the youngest of seven kids, and one of the first things my older brothers and sisters taught me was don't be no punk. Right? But, but they were teaching me to fight for things that weren't necessarily good for me to be fighting for. I want teachers to train young people to be warriors, to be warrior scholars. Don't push that out. Don't push the fight out of kids. Right? They need that fight to battle in this society. Right? But the question is, is are we giving them things that are more compelling to fight for than what the streets offer. Okay? And the answer is, a lot of times with our greatest fighters, we're not.
The streets are winning. Right? So, so is PlayStation. So is Xbox. We're losing. Kids are fighting. They are investing huge amounts of their spirit energy, their intellectual capacity, but they're not investing okay, in those things that are going to be the most positively transformative for the community. And that's our task as adults. That's our loss that we're losing to these corporations and to the streets. Okay? We've got to take up that challenge and win. Now, to do this, okay, I believe that, that you've got to be willing to struggle. Okay? And to struggle, you have to love. Okay? And understand that love is not the notebook. Okay? Love, right? love is a battle. Okay? And to be willing to battle for kids' hearts and minds every day, okay? you've got to have hope. Okay? And if you all have seen my work, right, this is right, the talk that people often ask me to do. It was the hope talk. And, and I like, I'm really invested in the term hope for a few reasons. One, because I like the definition, the dictionary definition. Um, I like what we're fighting in the research about hope. And if you look at neuroscience and social epidemiology, they're, they're actually investing a lot in measuring hope, particularly in kids' lives who are experiencing high levels of vulnerability. Um, and, and what I've found in my research about hope in schools okay, and, and teachers that actually elevate hope levels is that it matters a lot for all the academic outcomes that we're measuring. So I want to end by um, sharing with you um, somebody that I gives me a profound sense of hope. So a lot of folks know me from my work on Pac. Okay? And, 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 I, and, and I respect a lot of the work that Tupac did. I also think he's deeply problematic in some ways. But, and, and I would say the same about Marley. Okay? That Marley is, is one of those figures who has been um, as or more influential than Pac around the world. And <clears throat> there's a story about Marley that is told that I think captures um, what I mean by the kind of battle we need to support teachers um, to engage in. And um, it's actually told, uh, the, the best telling I've heard actually comes from Will Smith in a, in a movie. Um, and since... Um he had this idea, it was kind of a virologist idea. Um, he believed that you could cure racism and hate, literally cure it, by injecting music and love into people's lives. When they was scheduled to perform at a peace rally, the gunman came to his house and shot him down. Two days later, he walked out on that stage and sang. Somebody asked him why. He said, the people who are trying to make this world worse are not taking a day off. How can I? light up the darkness. And since we're a data-driven culture, um, I just want to say that this matters and it works. Okay? So um, the last couple of slides that I'm going to show you are data from what happens, what has happened in our program when we've used right, these teaching methods with kids who the whole narrative is right, can't, won't, never will, right, all that. So um, we do, I loop with kids. Okay? I'm going to show you our, our two most recent cohorts. Um, this is uh, them as, fr as freshmen, or actually as 10th graders. Um, this is them three years later. Okay. And that's our data inside of, and, and this is the comparative data for the exact same schools okay, in our region. Okay. And the little bubbles above them, this is them on my porch um, just after graduation, and the bubbles are all the four-year universities that they went off to. Okay. And then... And then we remix and re we repeat. We start over with a new group of kids, um, and we make some tweaks and some changes that are heavily influenced by what the families and the kids tell us about what worked and didn't work. Um, this is the, the next cohort um, in ninth grade. This is Muhammad, okay, the day after he gave me the bird. Okay. 
And um, this is them four years later, 95% um, four-year college admission. And I didn't put the district data up here because the district data didn't change. Okay. It, it was virtually identical to what it was five years before, despite all these reforms and all these right, investments because it's not about reforms and investments. Okay. It's, it's about making sure that those reforms and investments are truly and genuinely community responsive and support teachers to become that image of themselves that they've always wanted to be. Thank you.